And so we'll give it a few seconds here to catch up. And we should be good to go. Go ahead. Hello, hello everyone, and, and welcome to this uh, very special conversation with the leader of our Yukon Health System, uh, Dr. Andy Aguanobi. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us today and to have this conversation and, and hear directly from the leader of our incredible health system during this challenging time. Uh, he has been amazing and the health system has been amazing. Their preparedness has been remarkable and the number of lives they've saved is ex extraordinary. I wanted to give you a little background on how this whole event came about. Uh, we were having a, a meeting with a student group and a uh, student, um, Gabrielle Valles, who's a PhD student out, out at UConn Health, uh, had been listening in on the weekly um, town hall conversations on telephone that uh, Dr. aguanobi has been holding with UConn Health personnel, open to everyone. And she said they were uh, so good that she thought it would really be nice if students from across uh, the university could have that same opportunity to hear from Dr. Aguanobi and to hear about his leadership during this challenging time. And very graciously, Dr. Aguanobi agreed uh, to make himself available. So to briefly introduce him, Dr. Aguanobi is, has been uh, the leader of our Yukon Health System. Uh, he is the Executive Vice President for, um, for Health uh, at the university. He's been in that position for six years. He's also himself a pediatric physician. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Aquanobi. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, well, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, President Katsileas, for, for setting up this WebEx. It's, a, it's an honor. And welcome to all the students who are watching or listening in. Uh, as you know, these are unprecedented times. I've been a hospital and health system CEO for 20 years now. And as, as Tom said, I'm also a pediatrician. And yet, I never could have imagined this scenario where all U.S. hospitals would go from complete normality to battling a pandemic within just a few weeks, or where the economy and schools would be shut down and everyone would be sheltering in place. But here we are, and we just have to persevere and overcome the challenge, as we've always done uh, throughout history. And we have to take care of each other. In that vein, uh, my thoughts go out to uh, anyone that you know who has been affected by the pandemic, but also to each of you personally. I know your lives have been disrupted, and as the father of a freshman undergraduate, I know the situation also brings anxiety, if not for your, if not for your own health, then for the health of your loved ones. So I hope that today I and the panel of experts, uh, and I've been, I'll give them a chance to say a few words about themselves, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Bannock, because uh, he is a, our infectious disease leader. Um, I hope that we can share some helpful information with you as you navigate this situation. But one overarching message I would like to make sure that I communicate to you is that this too shall pass and your futures will be as bright as ever. And to support that argument, if you remember from history uh, about the 1918 flu pandemic, that pandemic infected about 500 people, 500 million people, uh, a quarter of the world's population at the time. And yet since then, the world's population has quadrupled. The modern auto and airline industry has been born. We landed people on the moon. And for decades, we've been experiencing the digital revolution. So we'll get through this, you'll get through this, and we're counting on you to be the future leaders, activists, and voices who will prevent the next pandemic or other similar events such as the effects of climate change. So don't be anxious and, and ask any questions that you have that can help clarify the situation. And I'm honored to be on the call. So with that, I'll, um, I'll ask uh, Dr. Bannock to just say a few words about himself and his title, as well as Anne Horbatuck and any other panelists we might have on. Thank you, Dr. Adiyomi, and thank you, Dr. Katsimas, uh, for the invitation to participate on this call. Um, I, uh, so I'm, I'm David Bannock. I'm an infectious disease physician here at UConn Health, um, and I'm also the hospital epidemiologist, um, which is my leadership role in infection control for the hospital. Um, so I, I have a re responsibility for taking care of patients, including the care of COVID-19 patients, um, but I also um, provide um, guidance to our um, our infection control program to prevent the spread of COVID-19 within the healthcare facility. 
Um, I also have some um, involvement with the uh, Department of Public Health um, in uh, guiding uh, some of their practices and uh, policies at the statewide level. Um, and I'd be happy to speak about um, some statewide activities as best I can. Um, and then I, I also have some um, involvement with the university at the larger context uh, with providing some um, advice and guidance on um, things like uh, reopening the university. Um, I've actually been in close contact with the um, athletics program. Um, with Dr. Cassiero, the UConn team physician, with providing some guidance um, on um, athletics at UConn um, in the future. Um, so, so I'd be happy to uh, address questions from all those different angles um, as best I can. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Horbatuck. I am the Vice President for Ambulatory Services here at UConn Health. Um, I have been with the Health Center for over 35 years. Um, I started off as actually as a staff nurse on the inpatient units and um, have now moved um, into uh, this role. I was also worked very closely in our Muscular Skeletal Institute. Um, in my role, I really deal with all of the clinic areas. So in our Musculoskeletal Institute at Farmington, our outpatient pavilion, and all of our 10 locations outside of the Farmington specific area, which includes our urgent care areas, our stores site that is out um, near the uh, main campus there, um, which involves a lot of our um, family medicine, our orthopedics, and like I stated before, our urgent cares. We um, also, one of the key things for me and my role is to make sure that we have the proper um, connections with the student health services out there. So I've worked very closely with um, a number of the um, people that run your student health services so that we have continuity in care as well as the athletic areas um, as Dr. Bannock said. So um, I'm very pleased to, and honored to be here today. Thank you. And good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm Scott Allen. I'm a general internist by training. Um, like Ann, I've been here quite a while, 25 years. Uh, I actually came here more as an educator and had the opportunity to, to morph into the quality world about 10 years ago. Uh, and since being medical director of clinical effectiveness and patient safety, I've now taken on the additional responsibilities of being the interim chief medical officer and the interim chief quality officer. So I have oversight really over all the clinical activities and the quality of the, of the institution. I also have the benefit of wearing the hat as Assistant Dean of Education, um, which gets me into the undergraduate medical education and the graduate medical education realm here. So it's a great mix. Um, so I always have education in mind, uh, looking at our clinical activities. And again, I'm also honored uh, to be a part, part of this. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Boyko. I'm the director logistics here at the health center. Anne's got me beat. She's got over 35 years. I'll be 35 years for me this July. <clears throat> it's been my pleasure to work with all of the folks collaboratively here at the health center to preserve and conserve our supplies. These have been the most challenging times of my career ever uh, in, in terms of supply side. And thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. Hi, this is Tom Trutter, and I'm Vice President for Facilities Development and Operations. My department oversees the planning, design, construction, and the maintenance and custodial service operations for all of our facilities. Um, we're here to support the team, uh, the clinical team, the education team, and the research teams in terms of uh, all the adjustments that have been made for from a physical perspective. And uh, we're now focused on supporting the teams as we start to ramp up our uh, enterprises and getting back to uh, our new normal. Um, so glad to be on the panel as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eleanor Doherty. I'm the Dean of Students at UConn. Um, thrilled to be here um, and uh, work very directly with reentry planning for our students and the impact it has upon um, the medical care we provide through student health and wellness, our residential populations, and really our sense of, of community and wellness as a whole as we look at a healthy return um, to UConn. So with that, I think we're ready for questions. Great, so our first question is, if a person contracts the virus and recovers, will there be a long-term health effects later in life and what effects are likely? 
Dr. Bannock? Sure. So, so that's um, that's a great question um, in terms of what's the long term consequences of COVID-19 infection. Um, unfortunately, it's really difficult for that question. COVID-19 is so new. Uh, we really um, can't speak much to the long term in any aspect. I think the two areas that are of highest interest are whether people who are infected become immune to COVID-19 and aren't at risk for reinfection. And that's an important area of study that um, we are currently uh, collecting data nationally to see um, how long the protection might last if there is protection, because um, that's really important when we think about uh, the future and um, whether uh, and how vaccines may play a role in terms of long term protection. Um, but the question about um, what are the long term consequences to the body after an infection? I think, unfortunately, we don't know. We know that COVID-19 primarily affects the lungs, the respiratory system. Um, but we're learning that there's a lot more of impact outside of that particular system and other parts of the body, like the gastrointestinal um, tract, as well as the brain. Um, but uh, fortunately, when it comes to long term, we really just don't know. Uh, but uh, that's going to be a really important area of study uh, moving forward. Great, thank you. Along those lines, the question uh, probably uh, would continue with you, Dr. Bannock, is after recovery from COVID-19, are you unlikely to get it again? Is there a probability of becoming reinfected? And then what would the likely severity be of that infection a second time? So, so those are um, all great questions dealing with immunity after um, COVID-19 and the risk for reinfection. So um, what we do know is that among people who do have confirmed infection, a large pr proportion of them, um, though not everyone develops what we call antibodies that are that may confer some degree of protection against the, uh, the virus. So what we don't know is how protected those antibodies are. So whether or not they're fully protective, like we see in some infections that basically make one totally immune from a reinfection. Um, or if there's partial pro uh, protection, um, for instance, maybe um, those who get re-exposed um, would have a reinfection, but it would be milder in terms of symptoms. We see that with other kinds of infections. There's some some of that we see with the influenza, actually, and uh, people who have some um, immune response uh, to the flu. If they get re-exposed to potentially a slightly different strain, they have a milder illness. Um, and then the other thing that we really don't know is how long that protection may last, whether it would last for uh, potentially a few months or a couple of years or lifelong. Um, and in infectious disease, we see all different types of um, duration of immunity. Um, what, what we can say is um, with uh, SARS-1, uh, so that was going back now a couple of decades, um, the immunity lasts um, for upwards of several months to a couple of years. Um, we don't know whether that's going to be directly translatable to um, SARS-CoV-2, so the, the virus that causes COVID-19. But again, a really important area of study um, that um, we'll learn more about in the coming months and years. Um, that'll have big, big time uh, long term uh, implications. We have heard a lot in the news about a shortage of PPE. Is that a concern at UConn Health? <clears throat> it's always a, ver a, a large concern for us here at UConn Health. I, I'll let Doc Rag and Obi address it a little bit further. However, we work actively every single day to acquire PPE, both uh, from our prime distributor and from around the world. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of keeping supplies on the shelf, we've not run out of any particular item. Uh, we're preparing to ramp up for the opening of the larger institution, which will put a lot more pressure on our supply chain. But we're working towards making sure that those items will be in house. We've also utilized the service, services of Patel in New Haven to reprocess our uh, N95 respirators, which helps us conserve the supply of the respirators, which are very limited at this time. Yeah, I just say a few words uh, and thank you, Jeff. Um, so for everyone to know out there, when we talk about uh, protect personal protective equipment or PPE, what we're talking about are several items such as um, masks that people wear when they're actually in with patients who might have COVID-19 or who do have COVID-19. And those are specialized masks that, as you've heard, are called N95 masks. But there are also other kinds of masks like regular surgical masks and procedure masks that people wear when they're, um, when they're out in the street, for example, or when we have uh, employees who are just working on regular units, we have a universal masking policy. And there are other types of protective equipment, such as the gowns that people wear, shoe covers, hair covers, uh, et cetera. At Yukon Health, to answer, to just add to what Jeff uh, Boyko, our leader of supplies was saying, um, at Yukon Health, we track per day how many, how many days we have of equipment. I would say that on average, 
we have about 30 days worth of 30 to maybe uh, two months of, the, of, of personal equipment at the current utilization rate for most of those items. The ones that we struggle a little bit with are things like the N95 masks, because they're very hard to get a hold of. And, uh, to, and as, you, as we sit here today, we, we have a short supply of isolation gowns, the gowns that people put on. But uh, a lot of people are donating supplies to us. Uh, we have, uh, Jeff has a whole team that is purchasing supplies. So we've never had any nurses or anyone else that has been short of supplies. Um, but we're absolutely always looking for extra supplies and there's a lot of people that are helping. Great. When should we be wearing masks? I've seen different recommendations and it's a little confusing. Should I be wearing a mask when I go for a hike in the woods or just when I'm indoors and social distancing is impractical as in a going to the grocery store, for example? So I can, um, I can speak to that a bit. So the whole concept of wearing a mask um, is we know that people can um, spread can be what we call asymptomatic, so not have symptoms and potentially contagious to other people. That's become uh, readily um, described in a lot of the studies um, that have come forth. Um, and that's the big concern that someone may not have symptoms, but still be infectious to others. So the whole notion of wearing masks in public is not necessarily just to protect yourself, but really to protect others around you uh, from becoming um, infected in case you are one of those um, people who is asymptomatic and shedding virus um, that could affect others. Um, so I think the most critical point to wear masks is anytime that you're around others, um, and uh, particularly within that um, that six foot uh, distance where we know that those droplets um, tend to travel, those respiratory droplets, um, that's where masking becomes really most critical. Um, so you know when and this is something that I discussed with my colleagues that the whole notion of wearing a mask is we we don't do this for ourselves, we do this to protect others. So we do this to protect our community. Here at the health center, we do this to protect our, our community at UConn Health Center, as well as our patients. Um, and that's really um, sort of our civic responsibility to uh, one another is to wear a mask. So it's really most critical when we're doing that, when we're in close contact with people, I would say it's um, gonna be critical when you're in an environment around anyone um, in, uh, in general, um, because uh, there's a potential for potentially spreading to others. Now, if you're out in the woods all by yourself, you know, I think the benefit is um, is quite uh, minimal, but uh, you know, really think about it whenever you're in a vicinity where there's other people around. Um, and it's also important to realize that the mask um, doesn't necessarily replace the concept of social distancing. The two kind of work in parallel. Um, so it's really critical that in addition to the masking that you respect that social distance whenever possible, trying to keep oh, um, six feet away from one another. Now, recognizing that is, there are gonna be scenarios where that isn't possible and that's where masking becomes even more critical. On those same lines is when moving back on campus, what is the best way to social distance? So, so that, that's, a, that's a really important question and something that we're thinking about constantly. I know the university um, is really um, you know, very focused on trying to identify opportunities for social distancing um, in all aspects of uh, the university. I mean, as I mentioned, I've been um, working with the athletics department um, and um, I was actually just up at stores um, at some of the facilities. I'm um, talking to um, the uh, head athletic trainer and Dr. Casiero um, on strategies for social distancing and the athletics program, thinking about what the future of um, collegiate athletes athletics may look like. Um, but there's a lot of thought that's giving being given to this, and you know I think we'll continue to um, explore ways to be creative about social distancing. I can speak. We're doing that here at the health center. Um, and uh, maybe uh, Dr. Agwinobi may want to comment on social distancing strategies here at the health center. Um, but, but at the university level, I, I know that's a big focus and um, it's going to need to continue to be moving forward. Yeah, I could just say on the, on the health center, we're, we're following the CDC guidelines in terms of social distancing. For example, in our cafeteria, we've taken away chairs from, the, from, from uh, some of the chairs from the tables so that people are not sitting so close together. Uh, we don't have uh, gatherings, any, any gatherings of, of any real size. Uh, we don't have them. Uh, everybody is masked so that when there's, obviously we're human beings, you're not going to be able to stay six feet away from everyone else all the time. So everybody is masked here. Um, and I just wanted to add that sometimes we wonder, uh, it's easy to wonder, you know, is it real that if, you know, that if I wasn't wearing a mask, I could, I could 
uh, become infected or infect someone else. And because we do a lot of contact tracing here at the, at the health center to make sure we know exactly who was exposed and who they, they exposed, we have found out that it is true that, for example, uh, people sitting down together for a meal and then taking their masks off to eat a meal and talk to each other, that is a source of, of uh, transmission. So uh, you could be social distancing and wearing your mask appropriately all day long, and then you want to share a meal with friends. So you sit down around a table around a pizza and you take your, you take your mask off. That is a source of potential transmission. So, uh, so just being very careful is important. I have another illness or an injury. Is it safe for people to go to hospitals or other doctor's offices? Yes, uh, I want to take that. I'll take that first. And then, of course, Dr. Bannock or anyone else can jump in. Um, so the answer is, um, is yes. If you need if you need care, do not be scared to pick up the phone and call your doctor. Uh, if you have an emergency, go to the emergency department. Uh, one of the reasons I'm stressing this is because there's a lot out in the media about don't go to the hospital, stay at home. Uh, they're busy, they're, you know, they're trying to be safe, uh, but the reality, and, but, but sometimes I think that can be taken too far. Um, and um, if you need help, call your physician. Now, what will happen is if that your, if it's sort of symptoms like a runny nose or a cough or a fever, you'll probably get a, or you'll probably get a telephone visit, or perhaps if it's a mild fever, you'll get a telephone visit. Um, they'll make sure that you're okay. If you need to come in, they'll ask you to come in. If you don't need to come in, a prescription can be called to the, 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 to the pharmacy. Uh, a telehealth visit can be conducted. Um, but, um, but if you need to come in, then that's something that really has to happen. Uh, so, uh, so, that's, so, so don't be worried about doing that. And I'll turn it over and see if Ann Harbatuck uh, or, or if uh, Dr. Bannock has anything to add to that. Sure. One of the things, as Dr. Andy had mentioned, is making sure people do call their physicians. Um, we have, again, the urgent care out there. You have your employee health areas out there to make sure that you call. And you do have nurse lines that are available 24-7 to be able to call. Don't hesitate to call these lines and make sure that you are taken care of. For us, um, we also want to make sure that people are safe when they're coming into our institutions. So as we follow the CDC guidelines, we have put scanning in places um, at port of entries. So when you're coming into the clinic out at stores, for an example, they will ask you very specific questions about um, you know, a fever and some other specifics, as well as taking your temperature before you enter those areas, making sure that you're masked and going forward. So we do, it is very safe to be able to come into our specific location. And I'll just add that, um, you know, within the healthcare system, we are, we always have been focused on patient safety, but now we're razor focused on specifically keeping patients safe from COVID-19. So when you walk into a healthcare facility, a clinic, an emergency department, it, it will look different than what it has before uh, because of some of those measures. So things like um, space, you will see spacing in the waiting room and um, a real focus on keeping people apart from one another and, and being particularly attentive, attentive to social distancing. I um, mean, even the way that we schedule patients um, will be looking different, um, not to mention the entirely, um, you know, separate way of delivering healthcare through telemedicine and video visits, which has become uh, really escalating. So, so the way that we're thinking about healthcare moving forward is really razor focused on, you know, keeping both the healthcare providers safe and, but particularly the patients safe too. Yes, and if you don't mind, I'll just add one last point to that. Um, and that is that um, we treat, I know that we treat COVID-19 positive patients in the hospital, and you might be wondering, well, you know, I, I, could I be exposed to it? We, when we're treating COVID-19 patients and COVID-19 rule out patients, we generally put them in negative pressure rooms, uh, which are rooms where when you put them into that room and you close the door, the negative pressure keeps the air inside that room and vents it to the outside so that that air does not spread elsewhere in the hospital or in the area. And in some cases, we actually have whole units that we call biocontainment units where we keep the patients in those units. And again, no other patients are put in those units along with the COVID-19 patients. 
So, um, so I think as far as COVID-19 is concerned, I think hospitals are very safe um, and uh, are very focused on keeping, keeping patients who have other conditions safe. Is it possible that the antibodies tests would identify the presence of antibodies in a person who had potentially recovered from COVID-19 as far back as last November? So um, that's a that's a good question. Um, it goes back to um, you know what I had previously discussed with regard to antibodies. What we know is that a very large proportion of people who develop a, um, a confirmed COVID nineteen infection develop antibodies, though not not everyone. Um, but what we don't know is how long those last for. So whether they last for a few months um, or whether they um, they last longer, we we just don't know. So it's plausible that if someone was exposed several months ago, they may have antibodies. But it's certainly not a guarantee that those antibodies haven't already begun to diminish um, by this point in time. Um, you know, we'll, we'll learn more about this as we get uh, long-term data um, on, um, on the, the longevity of antibodies, but uh, at this point, it's difficult to make uh, real clear conclusions on that. And do you need a referral from the doctor in order to have an antibodies test? So at this point um, in time, a referral is needed. Um, it needs to be ordered um, uh, mostly because uh, you need someone to help you with interpreting uh, the results. Um, both if they are positive or negative. So that's really the role of the clinician um, in uh, the whole process of ordering tests. Um, so at this point in time, um, that's where things stand. You need a test to be or an antibody test to be ordered. Um, you know, there is some discussion that that, that may be um, a little bit different in the future in the way that we think about test ordering. Um, but, um, you know, again, something that's uh, in evolution um, at this point. Given that the symptoms can range from nothing asymptomatic to requiring a ventilator and everything in between, how likely is it that there are far more people within the state nation who have already been exposed and recovered with COVID-19 without even realizing it? So um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we're learning uh, more and more that um, there are patients who become infected and don't have symptoms. Um, including a group of patients that have very mild symptoms that they wouldn't necessarily attribute to uh, much of anything beyond maybe a common cold. Um, so what the role of um, the role of antibody testing is really to help us understand that better to really know sort of what proportion of the population has been infected, but may not necessarily have had symptoms. Um, and that's what we call kind of serial prevalence studies. Um, and uh, we're, we're starting to do that kind of work um, in more of a surveillance research context with our healthcare workers. I'm um, trying to understand, you know, how many of our healthcare workers may have been um, exposed and asymptomatic, but there's that same work going on at the population level uh, where, for instance, you'll hear that in a certain county, they did widespread antibody testing to assess uh, what proportion of that particular county or that particular city um, were um, infected with uh, COVID-19. And then with that information, we'll be able to know what proportion of them um, didn't display symptoms. So again, um, Still something that we're learning about, um, but is a big focus of the public health uh, response to COVID-19. How will the university address protections for those students with underlying health issues, asthma or immunocompromised, and already go through the Center for Student Disability? I'm happy to respond there. Thank you. Um, so students needing accommodation would, would always go through the Center for Students with Disability, and we encourage you to do that. Um, and one of the things we are considering as we look at online options and in-purpose learning or in-person learning is um, what impact those um, preconditions might have on the confidence a student might have in the learning environment. So we'll be providing more detailed guidance for students as well who have those pre-existing conditions and are concerned about in-person learning. And Eleanor, will you uh, will you come be providing testing to all staff and students when they come back on campus? So the the governor's uh, recommendation to us in the report, um, which we support, is that there is testing available for all students. I can speak to that perspective, um, and it is our goal to acquire enough tests to be able to do that. Um, at this point, that is a goal. We would need. Um, enough access to the tests required to make that happen, but that is a goal that we are planning for for a fall reentry. And are currently, I should say, um, for students, uh, particularly on the stores campus right now, we are conducting um, testing and, and drive through testing for our students as well and, and have been for several weeks now. 
If the virus being present in droplets from an infected person were to be exposed to the sun's UV rays, does it kill or render the virus inactive in those droplets after exposure? So, so that's a, a, um, a good question. So we know that UV um, has some activity against um, inactivating the virus. Um, you know, this has been shown in laboratory settings um, and um, you know, has been uh, looked at in varying concentrations. You know, I think um, what we're still trying to learn is sort of what's the real concentration of UV light that's needed to kill the virus and how would that actually um, impact uh, common common day-to-day -day occurrences like uh, like droplets that are generated through speaking or coughing in an outdoor environment and using the sun the level of UV from the sunlight. So I think you know we don't have a clear answer um, for that. Um, there there is optimism about that uh, being a potential benefit, especially as we move into uh, warmer weather and think about more people being outdoors um that uh, the sun the uv from the sun may be beneficial in uh, reducing transmission uh, but uh it's, it's hard to make again one of those areas that's just tough to make a firm conclusion on at this point um, but there is there's certainly optimism um, based on some scientific grounding from what we know in laboratory settings as the state starts to reopen and parks seem to be getting and beaches seem to be getting more and more people is this um something we should be concerned about so i think i think that's a good question um again going back to my uh the last comment i think there is potentially some benefit about being outdoors um, but nonetheless um you know i don't suspect that the outdoor uv light would um, be able to inactivate the virus completely um, so there still is uh, potential for transmission. So thinking about those social distancing measures, even in an outdoor environment, uh, becomes relevant. Uh, so I think um, you know we we have to be focused on that moving forward. Uh, you know I think as we start to loosen restrictions and more and more people go outdoors, um, you know we still have to be um, be cognizant that uh, there is the potential for virus transmission and still really focus on those prevention measures. Data shows that young people 30 and younger are rarely dying from COVID-19. Is that population really at risk? Why not let classes be run as usual and have older students, faculty, staff take extra precautions like telecommuting, remote teaching, learning, and higher levels of PPE? So, so that's a valid question. Um, you know, the, the, demo, the data does show that um, older individuals tend to be more impacted, um, but I wouldn't say that it's exclusive. You know, we have seen uh, young people, um, you know, even here at UConn, we've seen young people who have become quite sick from COVID-19. Um, and, uh, you know, granted, uh, their recovery has been generally um, much better than um, our older patients who become sick. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we still have to be thinking about um, young people um, in a couple of different ways. We know that um, young people um, have the potential to become very sick, particularly those that have other medical conditions um, that would put them at that heightened risk for developing severe disease if they become infected. Um, and we still have to think about young people being vectors of spreading to other older individuals um, who may become a uh, risk. That there's concern that uh, young people um, who tend to develop milder symptoms can really be uh, kind of the hot spot for where um, virus transmission occurs. Um, and then all it takes is for one individual to infect um, a high risk individual to really cause um, that uh, morbidity and even mortality that we see. So, um, you know, I think we have to be really focused on young people as um, potential sources of spreading infection. Um, it, focusing on the risk to individuals, but as well as the community. So I think I, I think we have to be very attentive to it. Are you seeing a decline in the patients coming into UConn that have COVID-19, like the governor is saying? Uh, yes, we are. We're seeing we're seeing a a decline. We believe that we peaked in the number of patients probably on uh, April the twenty second or so. And we peaked at about 54 patients uh, that we had admitted in-house. Um, and now we're down to, I think today we're at 37 patients. So we have seen, uh, we have seen a sustained decline. Uh, it sort of is volatile, but yes, we think that, that we haven't. And, and that's, uh, that's the same as is being seen in, in the county as a whole, in Hartford County and across the state that we seem to be declining. Now, one of the, what we don't know is, you know, will there be a second peak of patients um, and so we're not we're not resting on our laurels. We're, we haven't declared mission accomplished or anything like that. These patients are are in house. They're 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 sick. They're very sick. Um, and um, and we're 
being vigilant to make sure that we're ready if we if we if if it starts to tick up again as we go forward. I don't know, Dr. Banak, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's exactly um, how we feel. You know, we have. Um, you know, sir, we have a heightened awareness in certain types of settings. Um, as you may have heard in the news, um, in uh, congregate settings like nursing homes, there's a big focus um, in the community. Um, but uh, just like Dr. Aguinobi said, in terms of our patients, uh, we are seeing um, declining numbers at the moment, but still really being vigilant for uh, thinking about what the future might look like. Right now is allergy season. How do you tell the difference between whether you may have allergies or COVID-19? So um, that, that's a good question because it can really be difficult sometimes. Um, you know, I think the guidance that I generally give people is that if your allergies feel very similar to the allergies that you've had in the past, the allergy symptoms that you've had in the past, um, you know, really monitor them and notice if there's any signs of change, um, that would be an indication that you'd want to pursue that further. Um, also be attentive if your allergy symptoms tend to um, occur um, not just more severely, but more frequently than usual or in environments that wouldn't necessarily trigger your allergies, be attentive to that. That, that could be something um, that might, might be a sign of COVID-19. Um, and then, um, you know, for those individuals who um, haven't had allergies before and then all of a sudden this year start to get allergies, those are the kinds of symptoms you want to be particularly sensitive to. Um, so, uh, you know, have a low threshold if there's concern. Um, you know, now that, um, you know, testing is becoming a little bit more widely available, you know, reaching out to your um, your clinician, your physician, um, to discuss your symptoms is always the, the prudent thing to do, um, particularly if they feel like anything outside of the norm. So this one is, how valid is the following argument that it will be very difficult to safely reopen Connecticut in the near term? The needed quarantine period for COVID-19 is two weeks. Connecticut has now been quarantined for eight weeks, and yet new cases of COVID-19 are still being reported. Assuming that 14 days is in fact sufficient, then there are two explanations for why new cases are still occurring. Essential workers are getting sick and people are acting irresponsibly. To protect essential workers, one needs PPE on a wide scale, which is a massive task. To be able to live with irresponsible people, one needs the herd immunity that a vaccine can provide. Thus, is it safe to reopen? Okay, um, so, so that's a, that is an interesting question and in uh, in, an argument that, um, you know, many are making, um, you know, I, I would, you know, just take a sort of step back and think about, you know, what, what is really happening in the community. Um, you know, we do know that we're seeing um, transmission, albeit at lower levels um, in uh, certain groups. As I referred to, mentioned nursing homes are really an area of heightened concern. Um, even certain groups of um, essential workers, um, and um, you know, first line responders are are at very high risk. Um, you know, we provide the appropriate PPE, um, and uh, they are protected. Um, but uh, again, anytime that they're going to be in contact with someone who's sick, there's going to be that risk there. Um, so, you know, I think the whole concept of um, of uh, quarantine at the large scale is really done for the public health mitigation strategy. That you know, if we all are in this as a community and we do our best to um, reduce the amount of spread. Of um, a virus, we'll start to see fewer cases, fewer hospitalizations, um, and fewer deaths. Um, in addition, that helps our healthcare our healthcare facilities be able to sustain their capacity to take care of patients, um, and not just COVID nineteen patients, but patients without COVID nineteen, uh, which was a concern with um, with surge that uh, we saw in places like New York. So, you know, I, I think there is really still that benefit of uh, the public health strategy of, um, of of sort of universal quarantine and then a slow uh, release of those kinds of restrictions. I think it can be done in a controlled way, um, but I, we still have to be vigilant and think that um, we can expect that there's going to be ongoing transmission. This is not going to be something that will go away to zero. Um, you know, especially in certain pockets of communities, um, you know, we're going to see ongoing transmission um, at least until we reach that herd immunity point, which may be quite a long ways off, um, particularly if a vaccine isn't uh, developed. So, you know, that's my my general message is that you know. Our, our public health measures have worked. You know, we saw this decline in cases, and that's really been um, beneficial in, um, our, in improving our capacity and uh, being able to provide care to the patients who need it. Uh, but we still really need to be vigilant as we start to loosen those restrictions um, and uh, really focus on the population as a whole, as well as those subsets of the population uh, where we may see potential outbreaks and really um, getting um, increasingly um, 
sort of uh, aggressive response um, in those types of uh, settings. While well, treating patients at UConn Health for COVID-19, are you using any of the items that are being researched, such as plasma, hydrochloroquine, or remdesivir, to treat patients, um, and are you seeing results? So, um, I'd be happy to take that question, um, although others on the call may want to chime in as well. So, um, a few of the different therapies that I've mentioned, um, we, we have been using here at UConn. So, um, hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, was uh, one of the early treatments that showed potential promise um, that uh, we, we have been using in our patients. Uh, we've been doing it selectively and, of course, with, with really vigilant monitoring for side effects. You may have heard in the news there's a lot of concern about um, cardiovascular side effects. So, um, it's a medication that we have been using, um, though with caution. Um, and we're constantly um, getting new data on um, the, uh, the role of hydroxychloroquine, the effectiveness, um, you know, may not necessarily be um, effective across the board, maybe in certain subpopulations it's effective. And we have a multidisciplinary treatment um, guideline that we use and we adapt it based on the um, emerging guidance. I um, you know, one area that we've been, um, they've been very focused on is convalescent plasma. Uh, we have a convalescent plasma um, program uh, here where we, um, we uh, have donors who are people who have recovered from COVID-19, primarily our healthcare workers, who voluntarily donate blood um, that can be used um, as convalescent plasma, the whole notion that their plasma will have antibodies, um, and then we can provide that to patients, and we've been doing that. Um, I think today we've provided, um, I believe, uh, nine patients with convalescent plasma, um, and we've seen some positive results. Again, uh, you know, it's hard to make firm conclusions based on our small data set, um, and there are emerging data sets that are coming um, from intra-institutional intra collaborations. Uh, we're part of a, a protocol through Mayo Clinic, um, that's a national um, multi-center program. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna get more and more data on that, but that is a therapy that we have optimism for based on what we're seeing, and uh, we're continuing to, uh, to work with um, the American Red Cross in um, sort of facilitating that whole process. And I just wanted to add that it's um, it's really heartwarming to see how many people actually volunteer out of the blue to donate uh, blood for plasma after after they have uh, you know uh, successfully come through a, an episode of COVID nineteen. And so, uh, as as Dr. Bannock was saying, the the bulk of our donors are actually healthcare workers who have you know, had COVID-19, have done well, and the first thing they ask afterwards is, where can I go and donate uh, blood so that I can, I can help others? And we've also seen people from outside do the same. So it's really all about uh, us helping each other, and that's been, it's been great to see that. Andy, I'll jump in. We're also participating in a trial of a medication called dipyridamol, um, which has been around for a long time, has some antiviral and anti-inflammatory effects. So we are going to be looking at that particular drug as well. So this one is probably for Eleanor. Uh, when will a decision be made on fall activities like fall sports and marching band? My student will be a senior. Could these actually be canceled? Um, I'm happy to, to start answering that question, but in, in saying that, um, establish that it's a beginning. And a lot of this is contingent on guidance that we have from the NCAA and um, other conversations that are very active, but not complete at this time. Um, so we, we will always be mindful of two things, um, the need to build and maintain community on our campus, which marching band certainly exemplifies at UConn, uh, but also the need to be safe. And so um, one of the things on our minds is limiting numbers for group activities. And I, I think that number at this time would be smaller than, for example, the large amounts that you would see participating in marching band. So that is our preliminary thinking. I have a lot of confidence in the evolution of science and our ability to make the best decision to build community and maintain tradition, um, but also to maintain safety. And so I, I would answer that with you know, caution that I'm not sure we'll feel complete confidence in assembling a lot of people in a close space, um, but optimism that we know the importance of doing that and it's on our minds. And, and that's why we're not in a position to make a decision about that quite yet. Um, but I do know the president's been in conversations related to NCAA as well. I don't know if you want to mention anything there. I, I think you summed it up well. I mean, it, it, we, as a 
leadership team have um, uh, identified a goal date of June 30th, sort of the end of June, beginning of July, in part, it, uh, in part in response to guidance from some of the public health and medical leaders you've heard from here, that this would be the time frame where we would know better the state of the disease and the state of the tools we have to deal with the disease in order to make those kinds of decisions. So we're working on all options right now, uh, and we'll just have to see where, where the disease is and the tools like broad testing, are at the uh, June July timeframe. So if those who teach believe, as many experts say, that ending social distancing in the fall will mean many more deaths, will the university support their decision not to return to campus? I, I will share as, as part of conversations with many, we, we, we will never want to make a decision that puts um, the lives of others at significant risk. And, and that is certainly um, not what is being asked of us. Uh, what is being asked is, is what is the way we can most safely and responsibly um, continue our commitment to students and to our research and to each other as a university. Will staff be tested before returning to campus? I know we asked about students earlier. Yeah, um, I can jump in here. So the, the um... The governor has created a higher education uh, council for restarting Connecticut, and that group has um, weighed in on what are the gating conditions in order to come back. And this relates to the previous question too about about uh, putting people at risk and safety. Um, and uh, the gating conditions include uh, testing everyone coming back to campus that is student facing. So that would be all students and, and all faculty and all staff prior to coming back. So uh, we would have to have that testing capability and um, we know we can't do that all in a day. So you could imagine that we would have to do it. Um, move in day would actually turn into move in weeks. It would probably take a couple of weeks to move in this year. Um, but we would have to do that testing. We would also have to have um, the ability to do contract contact tracing, and we'd have to have the ability to isolate anyone who we've who is identified through testing. So those are the the gating conditions we would need. And in addition, we need to have strategies to ensure physical distancing, six six feet separation in classrooms, strategies for preventing large um, crowding uh, going in and out of buildings and classrooms and things like that. So that's the way we're thinking of approaching it to get to get this the uh, risk down um but we will never get never get it to zero i'm sure the medical experts here will agree and we never have in the past either i mean we um we always have to con contend with infectious disease in, in the dormitories and um it, it's unrealistic to expect that we can get it down to zero and the strategy when we sent people home was to flatten the curve and um we didn't expect that we would be able to to eradicate the disease um, and as uh, Dr. Bannock said, it, it, that those strategies have been effective, uh, and that's what we that's what we aim for. Do you think there will be a vaccine before the end of the year? Um, so, um, so, so that's a, a really important question. Um, what I can tell you is that there are vaccines that are already in clinical trials, so that that's a good a good sign. Um, but what I can also tell you is that. Um, there's 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 so many steps that need to be taken um, to get to the point where a vaccine becomes available um, on the, a widespread population basis, which is really what's needed for um, you know effective vaccination. Um, that involves things like looking at the data from the clinical trials, ensuring the vaccine is safe, um, ensuring that the vaccine is effective, and you you can imagine that does take some time because you have to make sure that the response to the vaccine is is long lasting. Um, so it's not something that you could answer uh, right away. Um, so, you know, and then, um, of course, manufacture once there is a, an actual vaccine that's been identified to be safe and effective, the time it takes to manufacture the vaccine. So these, these really are things that take time. You know, we're all out there trying to be optimistic that we're going to be able to um, to uh, get to the point where we're uh, vaccinating the population on a widespread basis. You know, my personal belief is that will that will take some time. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the end of the year um, is uh, extremely optimistic, um, but, uh, you know, always best to be hopeful. Um, and we do know that, uh, as I mentioned, there's already the steps in place. There's multiple different trials that have already begun 
Um, so, um, you know, we're moving quickly with uh, vaccine development and staying optimistic, um, but, uh, you know, we need to be realistic with uh, what to expect. So we're coming up on our last two questions. Uh, what is the total number of tests performed for coronavirus in Connecticut and the total number of labs joining in the test, if you know? Um, I uh, do not have that information in front of me. I do know that the GPH um, on their website publishes uh, that kind of data. Um, in fact, the CDC publishes statewide specific data on um, cases and uh, some data on testing too. So, um, you know, I, I would say if, if you want to get that answer, pop onto the Connecticut Department of Public Health website. You should be able to find some uh, information about uh, testing throughout the state. Yeah, and I, and I, I would I, I would uh, echo that and say it's in the single thousands, to, uh, you know, between two and four thousand, I believe, um, uh, per day. But the the um, what I'd like to ask is if, if Ann Harbatuck, in terms of our testing, um, Ann Harbatuck keeps keeps the data on, on terms of uh, how many people we've tested and how many of them were were positive from our employees, et cetera. Do you have that, Ann, on, on, on hand? Just to, yes, I do. Hand. As of as of yesterday, we have tested um, 341 employees. 62 were positive and 273 were negative. And we had um, about six um, tests pending. And then we also test our residents, um, which we tested 60 residents. 14 of them were positive, um, 44 were negative, and um, also we had two pending. So that gives you an idea of yeah. um, out of all those, uh, the population, we had about uh, 76 um, positive. Uh, people. Yeah, and just to just to put that in context, so of the 5,000 employees here at the health center, we had 70. We've had 76 who were positive. Correct. Correct. Okay. And our last question is: uh, We hear a lot about deaths. Do you have patients who are getting better and leaving the hospital? Yes, we do. We have, uh, and it's a great question because that's exactly what. Uh, people ask me all the time, they say, do, do people ever leave the hospital? Most of the people who come to our hospital with COVID-19 go home extremely well. Um, uh, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but um, perhaps uh, uh, Anne does or, or, or Dr. Bannock, you probably have the exact number that have left, um, but the vast majority leave us and do very well at home. This is uh, Scott. Um, of 132 patients that have um, come in that are COVID positive, this is uh, as of about April 24th, our mortality rate has been about 25%. So you can think about 75% of the people who are COVID positive coming into the hospital ultimately leave, whether that's home, back to a skilled nursing facility, but 75% have actually left. And, and then in context, please also remember that the patients coming to the hospital is just a small fraction of the overall population who gets sick. So most of the patients, um, I can't give you an exact percentage, but it's it's the overwhelming majority of patients with COVID-19. We manage in the ambulatory setting. They have mild symptoms. They get tested, they test positive, and they recover without even coming into the hospital. So, you know, we hear a lot about deaths and uh, the mortality from COVID-19, but really it's a, it's a much bigger picture. And, um, you know, the, uh, the mortality is really just a, a very, very, a relatively small percentage of um, the overall number of cases. So really keeping that sort of broader perspective is important. That's it for our question. So I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Andy. Well, I just want to thank all the panelists for, for, being, uh, for, here, for being here and answering questions. And of course, I wanna thank everyone who has tuned in and has asked the questions. Um, I always say that it's a, it's, it's a fam we're a family, the University of Connecticut family. And so this is how we talk together and understand what's going on and make sense of it. Um, and then I just want to turn it over to back to the president, uh, President Katsileas, um, and to also thank him for, for the opportunity. Um, well, thank you, Andy. I'd like to start by thanking you and, and your team and this expert panel for their um, time and, and the answers to the questions. I'd like to thank those who tuned in for their wonderful questions, uh, very thoughtful, very insightful. Um, at least one of you is, is probably a logic major, I'm sure, it was a, a, a very deductive question. Um, but it's, it just occurs to me when I listen to these kinds of things, how fortunate we are to be part of the Yukon 
family, the Husky, the Husky Nation, that we have so much talent to tap into that we can, as D Dr. Agwanovi said, tap into it as a family and have a, have a kind of conversation like this. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate, incredibly proud of all of you uh, out there watching as well as those uh, giving the answers. Thank you again, this has been great.